All right, welcome, welcome. We're gonna get started and we'll just keep welcoming everyone as they join in. Um, welcome to this webinar called Bullying Prevention, Careful Observation of Our Students is Key. My name is Kristen Vincent and I'm the Assistant Director of Marketing at the Center for Responsive Schools. Center for Responsive Schools is the founding organization of the Responsive Classroom Approach to Teaching and Discipline. Also the creators of Fly5, the social and emotional learning curriculum, and the writers and designers behind the books and resources from CRS Publishing. October is National Bullying Prevention Month, and we were inspired to bring you this webinar today to share about the newly updated second edition of the How to Bully Proof Your Classroom book. And our goal tonight is to introduce you to some of the updated content in the second edition of the book and to hear from some educators who use observation of their students as a key strategy for bullying prevention. So I just wanna share with you some quick webinar tips and reminders. Closing other programs, tabs and browsers can help your computer run the Zoom application smoothly. If you're having an issue with connecting or freezing, you can exit the webinar and just try rejoining again. You have the Q&A feature and a chat feature. And so please use the Q&A feature for questions about this webinar, anything about the logistics of the webinar, or if, if you have questions for the panelists. And we would really encourage you to use the chat feature to share positive comments or connections that you are making with the panelists or the content that they are discussing. And finally, as a reminder, everyone here tonight will receive a follow-up email in a few days containing a link to a recording of the webinar. And the recording is also available for free and it'll be posted on the Responsive Classroom website and the YouTube channel for anyone to view. And I'm excited to introduce our panelists who are Zooming in from around the United States. And I'm thrilled we're gonna begin, um, I'm gonna introduce you to Kaltha Crow, who is the author of How to Bully Proof Your Classroom. And she will introduce herself and then pass it on to her three colleagues to say hi. Welcome Kaltha. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kaltha Crow. I'm the author of How to Bully Proof Your Classroom, both the first and second editions. And I'm joining you from Estes Park, Colorado, right next to Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, I'm a responsive classroom consulting teacher, a responsive classroom author of three responsive classroom books, and a retired elementary school teacher. I have taught every grade, pre-K through grade five, in a variety of different settings. I also, before the pandemic, volunteered in a couple of local schools that strive for equity, joy, and inclusion. Um, Patricia, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Carla. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Patricia Cano, and I am originally from Colombia. Um, right now, I am speaking to you from Missoula, Montana, which um, I have been in this place for over 20 years. And in my experience as, a, as an educator, I have been a teacher in bilingual settings. So in Colombia, I taught English as a second language. And here in Missoula, Montana, I have been teaching Spanish as a second language. And um, I have wore different hats. So I've been a teacher, a lead teacher. I have been a curriculum designer, a coordinator for the primary grades. And I have taught um, in different grade levels. So I start as a preschool teacher and then, then I move up into um, grade levels, all the primary grade levels and middle school. And now I am teaching in a multi-age level in second and third grade. So I am excited to be here with all of you. Thank you. Um, Natalie, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, I would love to. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm joining in from East Texas. My husband, my 10-year-old son and I live in Nacogdoches, Texas. I work at a charter school on um, a university campus. We are the Stephen F. Austin State University Charter School. We're a K-5 um, public charter school. 
for the last 13 years, we have been a responsive classroom school. Every grade level, kindergarten through fifth grade, implements responsive classroom practices in their classrooms. Um, it's very consistent K through fifth grade, and we're very proud of that. Um, for 10 years, I taught in a fourth grade classroom. Um, and then for the last three years, I've been the academic coordinator. And so now I get to go into classrooms and model and coach my colleagues on implementing responsive classroom into their rooms. So I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight. And Ina, last but not least. And I remember to unmute myself this time. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Ina and I am a public school teacher in New York City in the borough of Brooklyn. I've been a New York City public school teacher for, I think it's my 24th year um, before being a New York City public school teacher. I taught in non-public schools for about a, almost a decade. Um, I currently teach an integrated co-teaching class, which is labeled ICT, which means that um, we have a combination of special needs and general ed students in our classroom together. And I team teach with a teaching partner who's my general ed teaching partner. Um, I am also um, a consulting teacher part-time for Responsive Classroom. And I like to pride myself on being an anti-racist educator as well. And I'm very, very happy to be with all of you tonight. I'm so, so excited to be working with all of you tonight. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about, about the book and bullying. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell you why I wrote the book that I did. I wrote the first edition of How to Bully Proof Your Classroom because I was working for Responsive Classroom and I was presenting to other educators and people kept asking me questions about bullying. And I realized that I knew very little about bullying. So I spent three years reading academic research, um, visiting colleagues' classrooms, learning about some of the standard bullying prevention programs, and then writing about it. And I came out with the first edition of How to Bully Proof Your Classroom. But people kept asking me questions. And a lot of the questions were about cyberbullying, which I realized that I didn't know a lot about that either. So I started researching cyberbullying. I also started to notice my grandchildren's, my very young grandchildren's immersion in the virtual world, you know, how important the virtual world was to them even at the ages of two, three, four, five. And so I started learning about that and learning what, you know, at what age do children get involved in the virtual world? Um, what are some of the, some of the platforms that they use? And it was around then that I started working on the second edition of How to Bully Proof Your Classroom, which I was working on pre-pandemic. Then the pandemic came and I learned some really surprising things about children, the virtual world, um, what, what the effect of the pandemic was on our children. For example, during the pandemic, some children had really no virtual world at all and were struggling to complete worksheets at home, very isolated, very removed from school. I mean, school just didn't barely existed for them then. And yet many, many children's primary world became the virtual world. They that was really the only way they related to other children. It was major in their lives. In addition, and, and that environment really supports bullying in lots of ways because children whose main way of relating to other children was virtual were 
able to be cruel to others without feeling the impact of their peers' reactions. In addition, during the pandemic, we all were feeling great stress. Um, adults were had the stresses of illness, of loss of jobs, of isolation, of family relationship stresses, and many more factors that had an impact on all of us. And of course, we know that if the adults around children are stressed, children are gonna be stressed too. That is just natural. Um, and of course, children had the additional stresses of sometimes they were in school, sometimes they were out of school, sometimes they had virtual school, um, a lot of changing schools. And that stress led to great kindness on the part of some children and great and surprising cruelty on the part of other children. So for example, one of my grandsons after attending preschool virtually for many, many, many months was so stressed and so unhappy that his parents decided to put him in a in-person preschool. And the very first day of the in-person preschool, um, children started rejecting him, being mean to him, saying mean things to him. And it was, it was actually out and out bullying starting the very first day of school. So, you know, this is what children are coming back to school with in their lives and their experiences. And now, at least here in Colorado, most children are returning to in-person school. And we educators play a crucial role in reacclimatizing our children. Um, many have missed a year and a half of in-person school and need guidance from us, their teachers, their educators. So just a couple of things, more things I wanna say before I change the slide about the differences in the new and updated version of how to bully proof your classroom. Um, I included lots of more recent research. I included lots of more modern examples and updated examples from my experience in schools today. I also included a whole chapter on cyberbullying based on what's happening right now in schools. And I also, and I included new suggestions for picture books for teachers to use in their work with students, especially books including multiple cultures and multiple languages. And I did also include some information for teachers who are right now still teaching virtually. So there's a question in the chat actually about the great misunderstandings of what is bullying. And when I wrote the first e edition of How to Bully Proof Your Classroom, there every state had its own definition of bullying. Now we have a national definition of bullying and here it goes. Bullying is unwanted aggressive behavior among school-aged children that involves a perceived power imbalance. And the person who wrote the question in the chat, I you know, so deeply agree with you that we have great misunderstandings about, about what bullying is. Um, the other day, my daughter was telling me that one of the other parents in, in my grandson's kindergarten class were accusing a child of bullying because he's frustrated and angry and acting out although it has nothing to do with him feeling powerful. In fact, he's the least powerful child in the classroom. So, you know, educating parents is key so that we're all working towards the same goal. So the child who bullies is someone who has power or who wants power. And the child who's targeted is a vulnerable child. 
The other children in the class play a key role. They're the audience. Um, the audience may join in with the bullying. It may support the bullying behaviors or support the child being targeted. And I wanna be careful with some of these definitions because anyone can try out bullying. Perhaps some of us tried out bullying as children and it's totally predictable that someone will try being a bully at least once. And it also, anyone can be targeted by, as by for bullying behaviors. And these are normal behaviors and it's our job as the educators in children's lives to do something about it. So our goals as responsive classroom teachers are to create an environment where bullying behaviors are less likely to happen, to create an environment of kindness and safety, and to create an environment where social power comes from inclusion. Um, we do know that bullying takes place in the less supervised areas of school, the school bus, the playground, the cafeteria, the restrooms, and it takes place in virtual environments where children feel not watched. And those right now tend to be virtual games on YouTube, on social media. Um, children know that we don't want them to bully. And so they try to hide it. And so that's where the power of observation comes in. We need to watch for those little clues and they can be very small clues. We could, we, and we need to stop those small, mean gateway behaviors when we see them starting. Much easier to start it when it's a very small behavior than when it has already gotten out of hand. So I have some questions about classroom life from my colleagues here. So. The first question that we're going to discuss is what practices have you used in your classroom to create an environment of kindness and inclusion and safety? Um, Natalie, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, there are so many wonderful practices um, that we implement for, from responsive classroom into our classrooms. But I think for our school, um, the most important one is our morning meeting. You know, we're starting the day um, greeting one another, sharing with one another, and then doing some sort of activity. There are so many opportunities to build relationships and learn how to communicate with one another and just really build a community of um, not just academic learners, but social learners as well. Um, you know, when everyone's being greeted, to start off their day, you know, what a, what a wonderful thing to feel that bond with their classmates um, and with their teacher and anyone else that's in their classroom during that time. They have a voice or they feel like they have, you know, a voice and they're being heard, but it also teaches them to be kind listeners. And I think that's so important um, just, you know, to build on throughout their day. Um, it's also a time where we, as the teachers, are able to model those kind behaviors and let them see that all the classroom expectations that we've put in place, um, how, you know, how we could implement them with one another and just really just it just sets up our whole day for um, kindness and safety and just a, just a good community. Ida, do you want to add into that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, we also do um, do a morning meeting where we are doing a, a lot of our community building, um, practicing a lot of social skills like cooperation and having empathy and having responsibility. Um, we also uh, um, started the year off and uh, took a look at our hopes and our dreams, hopes and goals for the school year. 
And from using the hopes and goals, um, we've used the responsive classroom practice of rule creation, and then use those hopes and goals to guide our creation of the rules. They created the rules in our class. They told us what the rules should be in order to protect the hopes and dreams that they have for the year. And one of the things that is um, so wonderful about that process is it because as Natalie was saying, it gives the children um, their voice in, in participating in creating um, what rules the kids will follow. And then also it allows us to be accountable to those rules. Mm -hmm. And then anytime when we're having any struggle with the rules, um, we can take a second look at it and revisit them. And then that process starts all over again where they have more agency all over again and some you know, opportunity to share their voice about you know, what they think we need to do about the rules now in order for us to continue to have a successful year together. So um, certainly the rule creation process in addition to the morning meeting has been very helpful um, all the years that I've been a teacher and still to today. Patricia, do you have something to add? Yeah, our school, we, along with what Natalie and Ina said about um, morning meeting, we pay a, a lot of attention to that morning meeting and strengthening those social and emotional skills that we want our students to be using in those places that they are not being, there is not as much supervision as we already heard. Um, we also use practices from responsive classroom about um, interactive modeling. So we do a lot of interactive modeling in our morning meeting, but also throughout the day about behaviors on how to find partners in our classroom so that we're going to read a book. So finding ways for them to know what it looks like, sounds like, and uh, feels like when I am using those practices together. And so those practices come from the interactive modeling and also grouping the students during the academic day, just like we start with our morning meeting, but throughout the day, grouping the students for a math lesson or like a read aloud or like different activities that we're doing. So how we can partner them. So they have different opportunities to use those social skills that they are learning in the morning meeting in the academic way. And then they are using that them outside when they are um, in recess, during lunch, when they are in the hallway, um, when they are just uh, by themselves. The other things that uh, we have been using and we have invested in a lot of resources in the classroom in the school is just literature. We use a lot of read alouds and there's a, a book that um, we use preschool all the way through fifth grade and it's the how to fill a bucket. And we like these books because they are appropriate for preschool. You have a book that it's about um, age appropriate about how to fill a bucket and it's very simple, basic language for preschool, but then it just continues, builds up into greater levels and then great, greater levels. And then there is a chapter book that students can read and they have questions that are really interesting about how my actions are impacting other people. What am I doing? How can I stop those behaviors from other people? But it's in a very simple language. And we have um, just like studied that at the beginning of the year when we are building that community and spending that time when we are creating those rules um, so that practice from responsive classroom. We also have an other books that um, Katha mentioned them in the in the book. So we have we I mean we have different ones. And the cool thing about these books is that they are coming in both languages or in different languages. So they are in Spanish. You have this book, the Los Cien Vestidos, that is the hundred dresses, and it comes in different languages. So it's if you're teaching Spanish or if you're teaching English, the how to fill a bucket, it's coming in both languages. And there are many books that I would love to show you, but maybe um, if someone is interested, I can write it down so that we can keep going. But Thanks, Patricia. The, so despite our best efforts, small acts of casual cruelty sometimes take place. And there are actually a couple of questions in the chat right now about gateway behaviors and how do you define gateway behaviors? Where is the point where you stop something if um, you see it and what's just natural good-hearted teasing? So 
what's happened in your classroom, both virtually and during in-person learning that you might define as a gateway behavior or that you might define as much more serious than that? Um, Patricia, do you want to go first? Um, well, sometimes like a getaway behavior in our school, our school is very small. So like classes are 16 students, 14 students in each class. So the, the groups are very small and sometimes some students connect more with other students than there are just this, this the clicking start in different grade levels. And sometimes um, just phrases like, no, I just don't want to play with you right now. Uh, but then that continues mm -hmm. happening. And um, I, uh, many years ago for me, that was like, it's okay. Like not every day they have to play with people, but when you don't pay attention to that happening every day, that behavior becomes a bigger behavior that we then need to address because yeah. that's when the exclusion is happening. That's when the power is, is happening. And, um, and then the, the situation keeps escalating. So that one opportunity for like, I don't wanna play with you right now, then investigating more, what is that really is happening behind that? And observing those students in during recess and see if that is continued happening like today, tomorrow, next week, it has been happening many days and then it's happening in a very unkind way. So observing what is happening, talking to those students, students about like, yeah, tell me more about um, what is going on in here. So investigating more about certain phrases that students say like that, just, um, I don't wanna play, I just wanna be by myself, but then later you go and find another friend. So it's not that I wanna be by myself, it's just that I don't wanna play with you and something mm -hmm. is going on. So what is going on? And just kind of detecting that sooner than later because those behaviors tend to escalate and become bigger. Um, I see a lot of appreciation for what you're saying in the chat, Patricia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Natalie, would you like to go next? Yes, um, Patricia, I think that, you know, the observation piece is so important and just knowing that oftentimes those gateway behaviors happen maybe during transition times or on the playground or, you know, times that are unstructured and as educators, just being very aware of that and kind of being a little step ahead of, you know, the students and just being um, observant of what's going on during those times. Um, I often see students who, you know, it starts out as joking, light joking or teasing, but then the one that's being teased or, you know, joking with is not feeling the same um, about it as the, the one that's having these behaviors. And so just really paying attention to the reaction of your students um, and then just watching them as, you know, the, throughout those unstructured times is so important because um, it is easy to miss. I mean, you know, we have so many things going on in our classroom. And um, like you said, so many people working in groups and there's so much movement that it is very easy to miss as an, uh, an educator, but making sure that you are aware that those things do go on and just being just a little bit ahead of it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ina? Would you like to add in? Yeah, in addition to what Patricia and Natalie had said about those gateway behaviors, some of the things that I've also noticed is the passing of notes that have mean comments on them. Um, sometimes even passing by a child, you know, and, and leaning over their head to, you know, kind of like whisper something at them as you're passing by when you didn't have to go in that direction, right? The pencil sharpener is on the other side of the room, you know, but you went the long route around. Um, you know, those kinds of behaviors, um, you know, that seem harmless um, can really um, escalate into something that becomes um, uh, a problem in the classroom where the next thing you know, there's bullying that's taking place. Um, and, you know, it's really important to, you know, uh, uh, be observant of those behaviors and also to try and address them and not let them slide and don't let them go by. 
um, to let the children know um, that these are not acceptable behaviors. They're inappropriate and that, you know, it's, they, they are, they have no place in that classroom. Um, and that will, you know, go a long way in preventing them from, you know, resulting into uh, a circumstance later on where there's a lot of hurt feelings. So then sometimes things happen in classrooms that are out and out bullying and take on a life of their own. And perhaps we notice them through a small behavior. And then as several of you have mentioned, they can really escalate and turn into something big. And I'm, as, I'm thinking about what do you see that makes you know that this is getting out of hand? And how do you reduce the chances that it's ever going to happen again after you've dealt with it? Um, so I'm wondering if you have a, an, a, an event in mind that happened in your classroom. Um, how about you, Ina? Would you like to talk about one? Yeah, sure. I could talk about a few, actually. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we, we've had the friendship triangles. Um, when, you know, uh, there's a person that might be very likable in the class and um, there might be a couple of people who might be really close to each other and that attention that one of the, pe one of the um, peers gives to the third person, you know, can really become an issue um, that escalates into some negative behavior out of you know the lack of attention that that first person is get isn't getting from the friendship, um, and those are really um, uh, you know difficult to to spot because a lot of times um, the person who is feeling left out um, you know might then become you know uh, uh, I'm well, I'm going to get this person back or I'm going to ask so and so to help me you know, do something harmful to the person who's just trying to be a friend to everybody. Um, I've seen it happen in cyberbullying ways when the kids in my class who are, you know, on the older, the upper grades in elementary school have had um, email accounts and there has been some you know, cyberbullying that's been taking place in those kinds of cases. And one of the great things when that's happened is that we've had, you know, the pleasure of many of my years teaching uh, to have a technology coordinator who arranged all the email um, in the entire school to bounce back to him when there was something harmful that was being shared. And, um, you know, we were able to stop a lot of cyberbullying that might have escalated by just having somebody wonderful like that who was able to program, um, you know, the email accounts so that he would be alerted and then he could come to the teachers. Um, you know, in, in any of those situations where um, the behaviors are, you know, uh, look like as though they're, they're bordering on harmful or the gateway, um, you know, I think it's really important to then take the observation skills and then, you know, really start, you know, uh, digging deeper into how, you know, we're going to prevent those behaviors from escalating. And one of the things that I really um, get a lot of use out of is just going to support staff or related service providers, you know, and trying to get, you know, uh, their support in helping me like the guidance counselors who might see the children or the school psychologists who might have, you know, a relationship with the kid over the course of years uh, before I became the child's teacher. You know, and just reaching out to those people, you know, and finding out if there's any way that they can help support me with, you know, just exactly what the dynamic is all about so I can get to that root of what the problem is, what the issue is, um, because obviously the child is doing it because, you know, of, of a reason. Their need is not being met. Some need is not being met for that child. And so helping me out by, you know, going and having these conversations really can, can help me to offset and, and prevent it from escalating. Thank you. Um, Patricia, would you like to add into this? Yeah, um, I had a situation years ago and I, as I mentioned, it started just as a very simple comment. Um, I don't wanna play with her today, just at the moment. I just wanna be by myself. 
Uh, the moment that I had this situation, I thought it was not a big deal, but the situation started escalating. And I think in those moments, just that, as I mentioned before, those small things that we think that it's okay, it is not really okay when we know that that was not a very kind comment. And investigating, and um, I think working with parents is another good option, like communication with parents and establishing that relationship from the beginning of the school year. So establishing a relationship that is positive and that is a communication that is constant over the years so that it's not just I'm calling you or I'm talking to you just when something bad, bad, is, bad is happening, but that communication that is consistent and is, um, is going into a street way. Like I communicate, you communicate, we talk about. There are sometimes things that happen that nobody at the school knows, but the, they, the, the children are coming home telling stories. And sometimes those stories repeat over and over and over, and we don't know those stories. So it is important that when the stories come home, if parents um, know those stories, that they come to the teacher um, sooner so that we can address those situations as well. So, but having that communication, establishing that real positive communication with parents really helps with that and building that relationship in the community too, in the the learning community, I not mentioned about all the, the stakeholders in the community. So people who are outside our classroom, um, assistants, specialists, people who are um, in the cafeteria during recess, people who are not with us all the time, but that communication of like, I observe something and that we can communicate. So how we can build that community in our school so that we are all in the same level. We are all talking about the same things. We are valuing the same things so that we can support each other with the values that the school is living with. So kindness is something important and that looks like this and we're, it's gonna look like that during recess, in the cafeteria, in the bathroom, in a specialist, when they are talking to the counselor, everybody is speaking and the same when I'm talking to the parents of the children, like we have that. So the communication among all the stakeholders at the school is really important so that we can address these behaviors that some, sometimes we think that they are okay, but they are not really okay. Mm -hmm. and that become bigger and bigger. So that, that um, the work that we do, we say in responsive classroom, it is important the way we relate with um, our children, like our students, but it's also it's as an important as the relationship that we have with everyone at the school and with the parents of the children that we're teaching. Natalie, did you have something to add? Well, I, I do. I mean, we, we of course, we've all um, experienced those things in our classroom and it is oftentimes, um, like both these ladies said, it's often, you know, it starts out small and you don't, you know, you think it's okay and then it just begins to escalate um, we've had, we had a situation with some of our, one of our younger, um, children a few years ago where, you know, on the playground, they only wanted to play with certain people. So it's very much what you were, um, discussing Patricia. Um, and then we noticed that the reason that they wanted to play with just that certain child is because they were showing bullying behaviors towards that child that, you know, they would only let them do certain things and they had to play the game their way. And, you know, it was a, it was a good opportunity to catch it at such a young age. It was a first grader. Um, but to not just help out the child that was being bullied, but also help out the child that was the, you know, had those behaviors um, just to teach the child to you know, how to handle themselves, how to participate, how to make everyone feel welcome. Um, and that communication with all of, you know, all the people involved is so important. Um, making a plan that children are able to follow that in order for them to be successful is always important. And um, just making sure that you're staying on top of it and taking care of all involved is, is very important very, very important. Well, I want to add one thing, which is that oftentimes it feels like a natural solution to have student-to-student -student conflict resolution between two students, one who is 
bullying and the other who is being bullied. And there is a lot of research that shows that that is a dangerous practice. I'm a big fan of student to student conflict resolution but it needs to be used in situations where there's equity between the students. And when a more powerful student is having a conflict resolution session with a less powerful student, the research shows that it is the less powerful student who ends up apologizing to the more powerful student who has been bullying him or her and saying that it was her his or her fault. So I just wanted to get that in there so that nobody thinks that the next step would be to do some student student conflict resolution. Um, you know, we have a little bit of time left and Kristen, I'm wondering if you could pick out a question from the chat for us. Yeah, that'd be great. And Thank you everyone for your questions and your positive comments. It's been great to see some resources being shared. Um, so a question came in um, from an electives teacher. So this is a, a role in a school that can be tricky because you only have groups of students coming in and out, you know, 45 minutes at a time, 15 to 20 students. Um, this teacher has six different groups a day. It has come up often that a student will say someone is being mean but I'm unable to see or observe it because students are being sneaky when the teacher comes around to observe. Mm -hmm. So what are some ways that, you know, specifically for an elective teacher to approach a situation like that to de-escalate or to, to redirect it? Who would like to take this question? <laughs> Natalie, you wanna jump in? I saw you were nodding and connecting to that question. <laughs> Well, I mean, we, we um, have these situations come up as well in our, um, our elective classes. Um, I believe that they need, I think we, we've done it where we have had, um, you know, a, a beginning meeting in the elective classes before um, they start the curriculum part of it. And so that way that the students know that they are feeling, you know, that same connection and the same expectations in the um, elective areas as they do in the classroom. And so they're just setting up, um, you know, those strong expectations and modeling. Um, we've also had it where, you know, the, they try to separate the ones that, um, you know, they know that could be an issue. And it could not separate from the class, but just, you know, where they can keep their eye on them and make sure that those behaviors are not happening. I know that it's hard to, um, to see all of it because they can be tricky, but just knowing that, that those times that are unstructured is when those behaviors happen. Um, just really being observant and evaluating, you know, all the things that are going on during that time can be helpful. Um, and I'd also like to add on to that, too. Um, you know, one of the things that um, some of the elective teachers have uh, shared with me at my school is um, when we bring our classroom rules that the children created to the elective, um, because a lot of times then they have um, an opportunity to see the rules that we're holding the kids accountable to, and they can be part of that process as well when they're in uh, an elective class. Um, and so um, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know that I appreciated that as much um, until one of the elective teachers shared with me that they really um, uh, were grateful that we were able to share and bring a copy of the rules. Um, today, this morning, I'm not, this is no joke. I was just laminating them, an extra copy so that I could bring them to another elective teacher. And, and, the, and then the really wonderful thing is that um, yesterday, one of the children said, aren't we going to bring the rules with us to so-and-so's class? And I was like, oh, okay. So this is meaningful to you too, to have those mm -hmm. rules reviewed as well. And so I think that that's one proactive step you know, in helping the children to feel safe and, and secure when they are going outside of the classroom and into other um, specialty areas. I'm thinking of Patricia's comment about all the adults in school working together. And the more we communicate with each other, the less alone the elective teachers are. 
Kaltha, we have another question, which I think maybe a lot of people could relate to this. Um, and the question is, how do you deal with a situation where teachers have not seen bullying happening and maybe don't think that bullying is happening, but parents are insisting that their child is being bullied and they come to you with this? I think I'll start answering. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is such a common situation and it's also true that the people who know the most about children are their parents. And my first question is, have you defined bullying clearly? Um, because the parent may be, you know, irritated with another child or the children may be irritated with each other, but it may not be bullying. And if everyone has a common definition, if we've had parent meetings where we've defined bullying, where there's a common understanding of what bullying is, then we know whether or not we're communicating about the same thing. And if we have a common definition and the parent is feeling like bullying is going on, I my experience in more than 40 years of teaching was that usually the parent is right. And it's important again to observe carefully, keep a close eye on things so that we can have an open mind and explore this. Someone else wanna add into that? I, yeah, I, I just agree with, when parents come to you and say that there is something happening and they use that and their response that they hear is like, probably I'm not, I haven't, I think that what they want to see is that we're going to investigate more. Mm -hmm. and we're, like they want to be heard. That's something important that when a, part, a parent comes and we haven't seen it, they just want us to hear that we're, we're going to do something. And what we're going to do is investigate and we will get back to you. If we don't know anything that seems obvious for us, either in the classroom or in recess, because if kids are coming home saying and feeling that way is because something is not working for them. So I feel like just by saying, I will investigate more and be, and, and also sharing that when a parent come to you, sharing it again with the community at your school, like let's all be watching. There is thing going on that we haven't figured it out, but let's all be together, like eyes open for these situations, for these people that I've been hearing and then if everybody is eyes open, then we, we will find something that is happening and maybe it's just perception or is maybe reality, but definitely we find the root of something that is happening for that child and we can address it, whatever it is. If maybe it is happening or is the perception that something is missing for that child, some of the needs are not being met and we can work it out um, with the family and with the child. But the, again, the observation, that power of observation in the whole community and the communication piece with all the stakeholders, parents and teachers and the child too. Um, so I, I, I think that that would be important in that situation. There was a, a question, um, and I know in, you, in the second edition of this book, you've added a lot about cyberbullying and thinking about technology and stuff. So someone was asking about investigating a bullying report that stems from social media when you don't have access to that information, like you didn't personally see the post or what happened. So there are currently laws that support um, schools investigating event, cyberbullying events that are happening outside of school if it's, in, if it's impacting the school climate. And so it is really our job now to keep an eye on those events which is, you know, it's a reason that we should do some bullying education with students about cyberbullying and what are things you can do, encouraging students to take um, screenshots and so that they have evidence 
of cyber bullying events that have happened outside of school because cyber bullying that's happening outside of school really does affect our classroom climate. I don't know if I really is, did I answer that question clearly? Is that, I think, yeah, and I, I do think some of that is like a case by case basis, but mm -hmm. I do know many schools and and school boards and school districts have created policies about their social media and what happens outside of school versus in school. But Keltha, you mentioned that crosses over often. It really so does. Yeah, if it happens outside of school, it can impact the learning and the school community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's another reason to communicate really thoroughly with families but, and to encourage families to put electronic devices in public areas in their household so that children are not engaging in cyberbullying alone in bedrooms where adults don't see it. Um, encouraging parents to really keep on top of children's cyber life and letting us know what's going on because it we really do have a responsibility to keep our the atmosphere in our classroom positive and safe and that can be impacted by what's going on in children's cyber life even if it's not in school um i start out the chapter on cyberbullying with a story about an incident in my classroom where a child who I just thought was the sweetest little girl in the world, um, being out sick one day. And it turned out that she was out sick to engage in cyberbullying of one of the children in my class. And I would never have known. And in fact, the parents would have never known if they hadn't had um, controls on her internet use so that they were able to discover the mean messages that she was sending to another girl in my classroom. Um, you know, there, there are techniques to use and I think it's important to use them. And I do discuss a lot of them in the chapter on cyberbullying. Um, it looks to me like we have about five more minutes. I'm wondering if any of our panelists have last thoughts they'd like to add in. Yeah, I'll, I, I'd like to also um, say that um, in the life of, you know, anyone's classroom, you know, that it's really important to have moments and opportunities where you celebrate diversity. Um, mm -hmm. I think when you're doing that, you know, when you're, when you're um, saying that no matter what your background is, no matter who you are, no matter what your identities are, um, that you have a place of belonging in our community you know, sends a really strong and powerful message um, that um, you, you embrace everyone and that there's a, a place for everyone in, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so um, the ways that you celebrate it, you know, through your, you know, your stories that you read, like uh, Patricia was uh, sharing a lot of read alouds, whether it's classroom celebrations, um, whether you're just talking about current events, you know, there's always opportunities for you to, you know, embrace all the identities that um, the children are. And I think that that's really, really important if you're doing that ongoing on a regular basis. Um, I think that goes a long way. Patricia or Natalie, do either of you have a closing thought? Um, I, I agree. I know that that's, you know, very important. I feel like um, our class meetings that we have are a good time to celebrate. You know, it's not just um, to discuss some issues that go on in our classroom, but to celebrate, you know, the, the great things that are happening and all the people that um, are members of our classroom. But, you know, we're in such a strange um, time right now as educators and how wonderful it is to know that, you know, there are so many people that are experiencing the same things that we are experiencing and we can learn from. Um, and, you know, thank you to Kaltha for, you know, writing a second edition of, of your book so that we will have another resource to, you know, go to when we're in uncharted territory. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say that, um, as everybody's saying, like, we are facing a lot of challenging times right now. 
with uh, and as educators, we are being challenged with many new situations that we didn't have before. And it is important to take a moment to for us to take care of ourselves and just kind of breathe in, breathe out every day. And especially when we face those situations in the classrooms, because we will, even when we are proactive in the classroom, there will be times families come from different, like our children come from different families. There is a lot of diversity. There is a lot of needs. Right now, everybody's facing different things. People are feeling big feelings. There's a, a lot of anxiety. And we as educators, we are, we have a big um, job to do. And so in that, just taking, keeping in mind that we are the ones bringing that. So we need to take care of ourselves by knowing what is happening with us and reading our own feelings too, so that taking that, um, We'd say the, the mask first, put your mask first and see where you are. So put your mask in and, and, and hear where you are, feel where you are and take care of yourself so that we can bring the best we can in the classrooms. But um, be gentle with yourself. We're doing the best. We're in times that are really challenging right now and everybody needs different things. And by you taking care of yourself, you will be able to bring the best you can in that situation, whatever the situation is. Thank you. Those are wonderful words to, to close out our webinar. Mm -hmm. um, I put the link to the book. If you want to pre-order, we should be shipping those next week. Um, Keltha, so thank you so much for joining us, for speaking from your experiences as an author and researcher and educator and Patricia and Natalie and Ina, thank you so much for being here to share. And as we close out, I would love it if um, our attendees could continue to drop some of those positive comments into the chat um, or share something that resonated with you from the webinar tonight. We've had a really interactive webinar with the chat and the Q&A, and I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but um, your positive comments also help fuel um, the work that we do at Center for Responsive Schools. So. Thank you so, so much. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so <laughs> much to everyone.